Good morning. Welcome to Church Online. My name is Phil Mann. I'm the lead minister here at St. Weibergs and it's my privilege to host us this morning. I hope you are well. We are, what, 10 days in to lockdown 2.0 and um, I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're safe and well. We aren't able to meet physically at the moment, but we are able to gather and meet together online and it is so good to be able to do that. I want to encourage you this morning that we're not just watching from afar in our own separate ways, but we're we're called to be together. We're engaging, we're meeting with one another. So if you're here, I'd love you to write in the comments who you are, where you're watching us from, how you're engaging with us this morning. Uh, just let's have the conversation. Let's get it get going. This morning, uh, we're continuing our series thinking about living the way of Jesus and learning from him. Uh, But before we jump into our service, why don't I pray and then I'll hand over. Loving Father, I thank you that you are here with us, that you have called us to meet together in your name. And so now, Lord, we want to put down all distractions, turn phones off, stop thinking and worrying about other things and focus on you. We're here because of you. And so we look to you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to worship you now in spirit and in truth. Amen. Good morning, church. How are you doing today? I hope you've had a great week and I'm so glad that you've joined us again today. This week, we are looking at wisdom, our session on the website stwderby.org forward slash kids is called Wise Up. Be sure to go and check it out as we do go into a little bit more detail but also here is where you can find all the crafts and activities that you can do later today during the talk. But let's get back to talking about wisdom. First of all I wondered if you know what wisdom is or how you think you would explain it to someone? Well, I would say that somebody who has wisdom is someone that uses their knowledge and maybe their experiences and their good judgment to make good decisions or to just live really well. For example, it is wise to check the road and look both ways before you cross the road. You know that there are lots of different vehicles that use roads and you're using your good judgment that the fact that a car could come at any point and that you don't want to get hurt so therefore you use your wisdom and you check before you cross. Some people might just call this common sense but I do feel like God has given us all common sense or this kind of wisdom to help us through life. But in the Bible, there's another type of wisdom, God's wisdom. God can help us make the best decisions. God's wisdom can help to guide us, but also help us to gain understanding about some things that we face in life. When we look at Jesus, we see that he was really wise. But Jesus also says that he only does what he sees his father doing. And that shows us that Jesus gets all his wisdom from God. So we should do the same. We should ask God regularly for his wisdom so that we can make kind, good decisions. But Jesus wasn't the only person in the Bible who was known to be wise. There was somebody in the Old Testament who was a king who was known for being extremely wise. So let's take a look at his story now. King David had been king for 40 years. He was a great king who had followed God and ruled well. David had chosen his son Solomon to be king after him when he died. But Solomon was worried. He wanted to be a good king like his dad, King David was. But 
he didn't know if he was clever enough. Solomon loved God with his whole heart and often went to sacrifice animals to show God how much he loved him. One night Solomon went to the altar and when he'd finished worshipping he fell asleep. As he slept Solomon had a dream. God appeared to Solomon and said ask anything you want and I will give it to you. Solomon thought what would be a good thing to ask for? He thought about asking God to make him rich or powerful but then he thought of the best thing of all. Please give me the wisdom that I need to be able to rule your people well and wisely. God said to Solomon, I will give you wisdom. No one will be as wise as you. But because you have asked for such a gift, I will also give you the things you didn't ask for. I will make you rich. I will give you a long life as long as you follow me and my commands. Solomon woke up and realized that God had spoken to him in his dream. And God's words came true. There was never anyone like Solomon. He was the wisest, richest king ever known. What an interesting story. I wonder if God told you that you could have anything, absolutely anything in the whole wide world, what would you ask for? Take a moment and have a little think. If God could give you anything, and we mean anything, what would you ask for? What would you want him to give you? I think that some of us would probably be a little bit selfish and maybe we'd ask for money or more toys or stuff that we could have. But do you remember what Solomon asked for? Wisdom! Solomon is desperate to be a really, really, really good king. And so he asked for wisdom above everything else. He thinks about others and about his kingdom first. But what we see in the story and what's incredible is that because Solomon isn't selfish, God does give him everything else that he doesn't ask for and God blesses him in this way. Solomon asked for wisdom because he really loved God and he knew that by being wise, he would be able to live in a way that would please God. And God made him rich and famous anyway, but Solomon didn't know this when he asked for it in the first place. This was just a reward for how happy God was with Solomon's choice to ask for wisdom above everything else. When a ruler is just and rules well, it means that the people in the kingdom, they get to live well too. And that's why it made God so happy that Solomon chose wisdom. Now that we are in second lockdown, we need to be asking God for his wisdom too. We need to not be selfish and think about others first. Do you remember back right at the beginning of the first lockdown, back in March, I asked you to be warriors of kindness. Now I really hope that this hasn't stopped. Because being a warrior of kindness, especially at this time, is really important. Bringing happiness and kindness to others is one of the most amazing things that you can do. And you can ask God for his wisdom on how you can do this. But also, we make decisions every day, don't we? So why not ask God to help you with these decisions? Ask God for his wisdom by asking God to help you, you could make the best kind of choice. Not just a choice that makes you happy 
or the choice that makes everyone smile, but the best, most wise choice in that situation. Let's spend some time now praying and asking God for his wisdom to help us this week. So let's pray. Father God, we know that you are the best source of wisdom and that when we ask, you give generously. Knowing this, we ask for your wisdom today. We ask that you would give us clear thoughts to help us make good decisions now and in the future. As Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 say, Today we trust in the Lord our God and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways we acknowledge you and we ask that you help make our path straight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has been so great to see you once again and I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a really, really good week and be wise. Ask God for his wisdom. Bye!
Father God, we thank you for this time that we've got just to come together um, to talk to you, Lord. And I just pray um, for the people who are living on their own, who are feeling isolated, Lord. Um, I pray that uh, you would be with them, that they would know that you're with them, but that they would also reach out to you, Lord, that they would ask you where you are and that you would show yourself um, to them. Um, I pray that for us as a WORBS community that we would be able to reach out to people that we know are isolated, that we know are feeling um, like they're alone. I just pray that we would be able to be the best witnesses that we can, Lord, that we would, um, yeah, just be able to reach out to them, to help them, to support them, to give them food, give them prayer, to go on a walk with them, Lord, just to help them to get through this time of lockdown, Lord. Amen. 
Father, I just want to give Darby to you. I pray that you bless our community at St Webbs. But further than that, I pray that you can help us to help our community during the second lockdown. I pray that whilst the world feels like it's gone into chaos and turmoil, that you will bring peace into a sea and you will bring it calm. You will bring quiet and love and peace in a time where that feels so far away. Thank you that you have been there through the first lockdown, that you are not surprised or shocked that this is happening, but you've helped prepare the way for us. And I just want to pray for the people who are finding this lockdown so emotionally hard this time, that are feeling like they're at breaking point, that they're feeling lost or scared or stressed that they're worrying about practical things such as electricity bills or food bills or anything that you can take control of. I pray that you can help people focus on what really matters, on family and love, and I pray that you can help provide for physical things so that we can focus on you and our world. Thank you that you are a God that wants to help, that you want to care for us. And thank you that you have provided means and ways for us as a church to go and help people during this lockdown, during this second lockdown. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain and salvation in your name. to breathe out of the side. 
With me today is Coleman, a member of Werbergs, uh, actually a member of my small group, my Werbs group. Um, Coleman, can you just introduce yourself? How long have you been at Werbs? What's been your journey to come and join us? Uh, I think it's almost a year, 11 months since I've joined Werbs. I joined near Christmas time, I think. Um, so yeah, I've been enjoying Werbs so far. Um, uh, it's an uh, amazing journey at the moment, yeah. And um, having fun with um, learning with uh, Phil and with our little group, uh, the little banters and getting to know God a bit more. Brilliant. Uh, great plug. I love that. Uh, it's great to have you in my words group, Coleman. Um, now, Coleman, you moved to Derby for a job. Tell us what you do for a living. So oh, I'm a physiotherapist um, and rotational one. So I work in different departments every six months. At the Royal Derby? Uh, Royal Derby or London Road, depends. Okay. And currently, what what are you doing? Um, at the moment, I'm working on one of the COVID wards on uh, in Royal Derby Hospital. Um, yeah. So tell us. Uh, how is it? How are how are you coping? What's the situation? Uh, um, at the moment, it, I would say it's busy. It's similar to the first wave, or some might say it's even more intense uh, because we've also got winter pressures uh, coming as well. So um, the whole hospital, in terms of beds, are quite tight, and. Um, in general, staff are quite tired because they they don't feel feel like they've fully recovered from the first wave. Um, although there's a there's like a, a grace period between the first and second wave, um, it's still in the back of my mind that it could come back, and uh, and so we've not really re um, had a good break, and people are just feeling really tired and. It's, it's like when the first wave came, there was an adrenaline to, you know, to, to act up and get everything sorted. But now it's worn off a bit and, um, and you're seeing all the cases coming in again. And, and you're like, oh, is there an end to this tunnel? And, and you yourself got sick with COVID as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, uh I got it nearly three four weeks ago and i had to be off for two weeks because i had 10 days off fever and so personally for you kind of the work environment how how does it feel at the moment it, it's it's tough i would say especially from someone who's quite junior who um, who didn't does, didn't have like a lot of experience with like um, seeing very very poorly patients or or I think in general everyone just finding it quite tough because even for our, my seniors who've worked for a long time because the amount of poorly patients coming in it's um, uh, we've never seen something like that uh, or at least in the UK we've never seen something like that and some of them get better and some of them don't and the amount of deaths deaths we see are uh, quite high in numbers and uh, emotionally uh, it's quite difficult for us sometimes. Yeah. So Coleman how as a church can we be supporting you guys and lots of other medical staff come are part of words but also how can we be praying for you? Um, I, um, I think one of the things is to ask for God's healing power to um or to you 
know, find a way to cure this virus, like whether it's like vaccines or I'm, I'm not too familiar with that side of things, but hopefully there'll be a way where we can treat it more efficiently or prevent it from happening. Um, I think that would be something we'll really appreciate. And it's also maybe praying for us to be, you know, strong, you know, like to keep forward and keep fighting um, and continue our work in, you know, helping those who are quite poorly. Um, in uh, the first lockdown, we stood on our doorsteps at eight o'clock every Thursday evening and clapped to thank all of you amazing NHS staff. And um, whilst we're not doing that physically anymore, uh, we still want to say that we think all of you are superheroes. We are so grateful for all that you are doing to support so many, to put your own health at risk, um, to help other people. And so we think you're amazing. We are cheering you on and um, we'd love to pray for you now. So is that all right? Can I? Can I pray for you, Colin? Yeah, thank you. Loving Father, we do thank you for Coleman and all of our staff working at the NHS. Those who are putting their lives on the line to serve and to help other people. And Lord, we know that this disease just does not seem to go away and the numbers are going still in the wrong direction. And so we are asking, Lord, for an end to coronavirus. We are asking that you will put a supernatural stop to it. Lord, we thank you for the work on the vaccine. We thank you for all the science that has gone into that. And we pray that that may come soon. But Lord, will you protect? Will you watch over? Will you care for all those who are caring for us? Give them strength. Give them wisdom. And Lord, help them to process all that they are seeing day in day out lord give them the ability to come to you with all sorts of emotions and fears and concerns with all that they're dealing with so father we pray your blessing upon them all watch over them fill them with your spirit and use them we ask in jesus name amen, amen. thank you coleman thank you phil even in the midst of lockdown, there are still many things going on in the life of St. Weibergs. I want to take the next few minutes to explain a few of those things and invite you to come and be involved. Lockdown 2.0 is giving us a second opportunity, a chance to, to push into some of the things that perhaps we wish we pushed into a little bit more first time round. And one of the things we feel absolutely called to do is pray. And so we've called the church to pray three times a day, Monday to Friday, for the four weeks of lockdown. To pray at 8 a.m., midday and 7 p.m. And we're primarily doing that on Zoom. We are inviting you to come and join us on a Zoom prayer meeting. We're praying for 15, 20 minutes, short, sharp prayers. We are interceding. Two uh, Chronicles 7, famous verse says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. It's a promise that we are standing upon. And so we are desperate to seek God's face and to repent and turn from things where we've got it wrong. And so we're inviting you to come and join us in that. We, don't, we do want to see God move in the sense that we want to see an answer to these prayers. We want to see an end to COVID and uh, people's mental health and employability stuff uh, change. But first and foremost, we want to seek God. We want to seek a move of him across our city. We are crying out for revival in Derby. And so we'd love you to come and join us for that. So uh, eight, midday, seven, Come and join us for prayer if you can. The link has been sent out a couple of times by email. If you still haven't got it, let us know and we'll send it to you. Or if you can't make it on Zoom, then um, just set a reminder in your phone for those three times during the day and pray wherever you are, however you can. The other thing, the second thing we want to talk about is Christmas. Christmas is coming and we are at work trying to um, work out how we can do our Christmas carols uh, this December but 
one of the things that we want to be involved with this Christmas is not just thinking about us, but it's how we can bless others. Derby City Mission have realised that there are a number of children across our city this year who perhaps will not be able to get uh, gifts as other kids would normally do at Christmas. In fact, they've identified already 450 families to support. And so they're asking us to be part of their Christmas connection, which is so that we can give to those kids who are in need this Christmas time, that they may know a little bit of joy in the midst of what's been a very difficult year. The way they're asking us to do that is to to buy brand new gifts for these young people. And uh, one of the ways in which they're doing that, you can either buy them and drop them off at their headquarters. We'll send out all the information to this on email. Uh, Either drop it off at their headquarters or go through an Amazon wish list. And you can literally click on the Amazon wish list, see what people uh, are asking for, buy the present and send it directly into Derby City Mission. They'll unwrap it and then wrap it up properly uh, as a Christmas gift and then they'll take it around and deliver it. Or you can just, instead of buying a gift, you can donate financially. All of the information will come out on an email and we would love you to consider to be really generous. It's one of our core values here at St. Werbergs, it's generosity and we'd love you to be generous this Christmas, if you can, to bless those who are in need. One of the other things that we are in conversation with the council about at the moment are children who um, are leaving foster care. At around age 17, they start to move out of foster care and into start of an independent living place. And um, that becomes quite a vulnerable and scary moment for some of these young people. A lot of them have been quite uh, institutionalised, gone from care home to care home or whatever it may be. And the council have asked us uh, if we could help support some of these young people. We're looking for kind of three or four host families. Now, we say families, it could be households or individuals. It's people really who want to kind of parent or be a big brother or sister to some of these young people. Take them out for dinner once COVID allows. Um, Ask them how they're doing. Talk to them about job applications and college and various other things. It's about walking alongside people. One of the key things that uh, some of the people who've been in foster care for a while realise is that a lot of the people who are caring for them are being paid to care for them. And what they are desperate for are people who aren't being paid, but who actually just will love them and walk with them. And so we as a church have an opportunity to do just that, to make a difference to a community in our city where we can actually walk alongside and help these people. If you are interested in any way, in supporting these host family situation, then I'd love you to email Anna, anna.man at stwderby.org. And she'll be able to give you more information and talk to you about it. You obviously need a a DBS check um, and there'll be some training that will be involved in this, but then you'll be uh, asked to just care for a young person who is stepping into independent living for the first time. So three things, prayer, Christmas connection and host families. Uh, Three ways in which we can continue to push in, even during lockdown, for all that God has for us and for our city during this time. Good morning or afternoon or evening, whenever it is that you are watching this, it's good to be with you. We are well into our second lockdown now, or lockdown 2.0 as it's been known. How are you? I wonder how you're coping and how you're finding this this season again. Is it a frustration, here we are again, or is it an opportunity? I've definitely felt frustrated. It's definitely been more of a, we had a a bit of freedom over the summer. We've got beginnings of kind of hints of normality or not really fully, but a start, schools were back, church was back, um, and now we're back into lockdown. But we've been challenged this week and I've been we've been thinking a bit uh, about this question about how we see this second lockdown, not as a frustration to endure, but more of an opportunity to enjoy. How do we make the most of it? And what we've been trying to think about is what do we miss that first time around? What do we wish we could have done better? Um, And how can we maybe manage to do this time really well? Did we spend a lot of our time on Netflix or zoning out or 
uh, definitely did a fair bit of that. Um, or did we spend time with family as much as we could, encouraging them, serving others in the ways, in new and different ways? It took a lot for me, I think, reflecting back just to um, kind of get through the day, the normal rhythms of uh, homeschooling and cooking and family and caring for people and cooking. Uh, uh, shopping for food those everyday tasks just seem to take over and fill my day so this isn't it's nothing to do with it being a judgment it's or a challenge to you must do more you must do better we must strive and achieve and be well beating and all of that stuff uh, it's more of a question and a hope I think to to maybe spark some thought and discussion and ideas and be open to what God might be whispering to us in this time in this season that we might we might do it well we might live well we might serve him well in these moments. Today we're continuing our series on the way of Jesus. Uh, we're looking at how Jesus lived his life and what we can learn from that, how we can live our lives well. And specifically today we're thinking about Jesus' wisdom, the wisdom that he had to know what to do and what not to do. Um, in some ways, it feels a little bit like this isn't so applicable to us today because there's limits on what we can and what we can't do. Um, so we're slightly uh, tied down with what we can do. But yet every day we still have choices to make about how we live our lives, the things that we do or we say or we think. It can have an impact on the way, that, on the rest of our lives. Jesus made choices every day and impacted those around him. He chose to forgive the woman caught in adultery. He chose 12 particular disciples over other possible disciples. He chose to confront, to speak out, to challenge the Pharisees, which ultimately led to his death. He chose to love. He chose to turn water into wine, an interesting miracle. He chose to leave one place and go to another. At one point, his disciples came to find him and they said, everyone's looking for you. Where are you? They're longing to, to meet with you. And Jesus' answer was actually to turn his back on those people and he said let's go on to the next towns because I'm supposed to be preaching there that's why I've come he made that choice to go from one place to the next and our choices have an impact and we need God's wisdom every day as we make these choices so the passage today that we're going to look at to hopefully help us with this a bit is John chapter 5 verses 19 to 24 this is Jesus' wisdom for how he lived, how he made choices and how he knew what to do and maybe what not to do. So verse 19, Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man then you will truly be astonished. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Anyone who does not honour the Son is certainly not honouring the Father who sent him. So... Jesus' wisdom for what we should and shouldn't do is actually fairly clear at the start of that in some ways. Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. And what he does, I do. Like Father, like Son, as they say. So if we're to follow Jesus' wisdom and try and discern what this means for us, we can also ask ourselves the same question. What do I see the Father doing? I'm going to do that. I was listening to a talk the other day on discerning God's will and the speaker said we need to ask better questions rather than God just tell me what to do what do you want me to do what can I do for you we should be asking God what are you doing Jesus how can I see like you saw you saw what the father was doing you knew what he was doing how can I see that too you saw what your father was doing and you did the same help me to do the same so that's the challenge. <clears throat> I don't really have any answers on how we do that, but a few thoughts maybe that will help prompt us and enable us to start thinking about this for ourselves. What do we see the Father doing? What does he want us to know about him and who he is that might then help us to live well? Firstly, there's a, a few, just a few things I'm gonna go through because we could talk about who God is 
all day every day and uh, wouldn't run out of things to talk about so I'm just going to pick a few because our time is short this morning. God is a creator. First thing that we see of God when we open the Bible in Genesis 1, he is bringing life into being. He is bringing order out of chaos. He is bringing creativity, abundance. He's filling those empty spaces with life, colour, vibrancy, new things. God is a creator and we are made in his image. We are called to create, to be inspired, to bring life and hope where there is helplessness, hopelessness, emptiness, where there's a void, 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 where there's a gap, where there is a space, where there's some new, um, something new is needed. We are called to step in to, to fill those gaps. What are we being called to create in these days? How can we bring life and hope to those around us. I'm amazed and awestruck by the ability of scientists to create a vaccine in that short space of time. And I read the, the article, one of the articles about it on the news. I didn't really understand uh, hardly any of the words that they use describing the process. There is such intelligence and creativity out there, above and beyond my understanding. But the interesting thing that they said in that article was that they had taken a totally different approach in creating this vaccine. It was a new way, a new method. They had, been, they had had to use creativity in coming up with a solution that was so desperately needed. And I pray that, to, that we also as a congregation might be able to be inspired by that creativity that we might in our spaces, in our places, in the, with the people that we know and that we meet day in, day out. Maybe we can show that creativity that will bring life and freedom. We probably aren't being called to create a vaccine, but we can have an impact on others. We can help them flourish and bring life. Who are we praying for? Who can we serve? Who can we leave a gift bag on the doorstep for? Who can we send an encouraging message to that might bring hope and joy to someone? The unexpected little moment of, of uh, joy or happiness. What good things can we be creating in this season? So God's a creator, but God is also gracious and compassionate. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 6, this is one of the foundational passages for our understanding of who God is. And in this passage, he chooses to reveal himself to Moses. He declares who he is. He names himself and describes himself to Moses. He shows his character and his glory. And it says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That is who God is. That is what Jesus sees God being and doing. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. How can we abound in love this week? That's a challenge. How can we show faithfulness and commitment to those around us? How can we be gracious and compassionate? Who needs grace? Who need, I imagine most people around us need to be shown some grace and care. Where are we being called to maybe go the extra mile to look out for somebody? The most challenging of these, I think, is being slow to anger. How can we be slow to anger this week? What does that look like for me, for my family, if I choose to be gracious, not snap out of frustration because they still haven't cleaned their teeth and it's been a daily requirement since they were very small and yet still it's not happening. Those moments where actually grace and love and a gentle word might be more of an encouragement than frustrated, frustration or anger. These are the choices that we need to make this week and it might not help us in those big decisions where we're trying to discern the right job, the right partner, the right um, schools, things, to course to study, those bigger decisions. How am I best to spend my time? Where do you want me, God? Those kind of questions. But these decisions day in, day out will shape our character. They will be, they will allow us to then become the people that God has created us to be. We will become obedient to him first and foremost. 
And as we do that, as our hearts and minds, we allow those, our hearts and minds, our lives to be shaped by God, we will find that we are then transformed by him, by the renewing of our minds, which then enables us to know what God's perfect and pleasing will is, as we read in Romans 12. So God is a creator. God is compassionate and gracious. God also rests. After God creates the world in, seven, in six days, the seventh day, he rests. He stops his work, he puts his feet up, and he takes the day off. I was reading uh, Ezekiel the other day, and it was I, was I hadn't really noticed before. It was interesting that actually one of the things that God, did, he's, there's a lot about judgment in Ezekiel, and God's judgment, and his anger on the people, and the ways that they have um, not fulfilled his commandments but particularly he, there was judgment on Israel because they had failed to keep the Sabbath which I thought was was interesting because we see keeping the Sabbath as a bit of a choice and if I do it oh that's nice that's a good thing to do we don't see it as the, the way it was intended I think with, with God he gave it as a command this is something that if you do it is life-giving it's not really a choice it's a command from God. He tells us to do it in order that life will go well for us. It's not just a good idea and, well, you know, take it or leave it. Actually, God's saying it's far more fundamental to us than that, than we even really realise, I think. It's something that brings life and delight and joy and is fundamental for our well-being and our ability to live well. Now, this could be a whole sermon in itself, if not a whole sermon series. So I don't have space this morning to really say much more about what keeping the Sabbath looks like. And probably even hearing that phrase might bring back some thoughts or ideas that seem to not quite fit with life in our culture and our day. But there's been a lot that has been written about this that is so um, is, is amazing and really inspiring and encouraging and help it, in helping us figure it out and figure out what it looks like for each one of us to keep the Sabbath because it will be slightly different. But it's a good thing to start exploring and to think about. And if you want to know any more, then uh, please do come to me. I've got suggestions of books and send you to the wisdom of people who know far more than I do. So God is a creator. He's a gracious and compassionate God. He's a God who rests. And he's also, finally, he's the God of the unexpected. God doesn't often answer our prayers. I've found, maybe it's me, but I imagine it's the same. He doesn't often answer our prayers the way that we would want. He works in an unexpected way. Jesus said no to a whole city of people. They were looking for him. They wanted to come to him. They wanted to know more from him. They wanted to see him perform miracles. And he said no. He was going on to another city to speak, to preach the good news to them. Jesus ate and drank with sinners. He was accused of only feasting and never fasting. He chose to spend time with just a select few and those, that, that time he spent with his disciples, as the time grew closer for him to, to go to the cross, actually it increased the amount of time that he spent with just a few rather than widening out and spending time with more and more people the less time he had the opposite to how I would have assumed it or what I would naturally think is the is the way forward so where is God calling us to the unexpected to the place we never thought of to look out for the person that maybe we haven't noticed before but God's drawing our attention to maybe to say no to the opportunity that is presented before us because it's it's good but it's not great which then enables us to have space to say yes to the things that God does have for us. And I don't know what it is that you are seeking God's wisdom for this week, but it may be that there is something unexpected. It may be that there is something ahead that you haven't thought about or realised, but God is a God who works in different ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. His, his thoughts are higher than ours. So let's be open to the unexpected, to what God might be doing in and through us this week. Jeremiah 17 verses 7 to 8 says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries 
in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord in a year of drought or in a year of a pandemic. They will never fail to bear fruit. How true is that for us this year? We are in a year of drought, a year of the unexpected. So much has happened this year that we have not expected. And yet, when we trust in God, our confidence is in him. And we know that we can continue to bear fruit. We might not have expected in a year of a pandemic to be able to plant a church. But we have seen God's blessing, his enabling, his making a way where we thought there were no possibilities. And he is at work. He is still at work. He is always at work. So in a world where there is uncertainties, where there is constant change, the pressures that we are all facing in these current times, we're all faced with decisions and choices day in, day out. And actually our natural instinct is to long for clarity and for certainty. I know it certainly is for me. And I think over the years, my most frequent prayer is God just show me what to do. Just make it clear. Just tell me and then I'll do it. Show me the right way, the right job, whatever it might be. And yet that prayer so often hasn't been answered or at least not in the way that I'd like a booming voice or lights in the sky you know that kind of thing it hasn't happened so I'm still waiting for that but we we have to figure it out bit by bit and we do it that way or God uh, allows us or encourages us to do it that way rather than the booming voice because it builds faith it builds trust it might not be certain and sure always but we know God is certain he is unshakable and he is a firm foundation so we know we can trust him in the midst of it we wait on him we trust in him and then clarity we hope will follow day by day there's a story told of a man who traveled halfway across the world to spend time with mother Teresa. he wanted to seek her wisdom on how best he might spend the rest of his life he asked her to pray for clarity for him and her reply was no I will not pray for clarity. His reply to her was, well, you seem to have this clarity, the clarity that I am looking for. How have you got it? And her response was, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. And our prayer today is the same. We might not be able to pray for clarity. Well, we can pray for clarity. We might not receive clarity but we can pray and know that we will receive an ability to trust a God who is totally trustworthy who is totally faithful and will never leave us over the this week um it seems to have been trouble sleeping particularly in in this in our house in this week and Olivia at bedtime is uh, I mean every night every night she has to go to bed and every night it's like it's a surprise to her and we have a little bit of a, you know, I don't want to go to bed, I don't like going to bed, you know, all of that, to and forth. You have to go to bed every night. It's, that's what you have to do. It happens. And in the end, the way that encourages her and helps settle her and calm her, what she wants is she just wants me to be with her. She just wants me to sit there, to hold her hand and to wait with her. I don't do anything that is any different to if she was there on her own. There's no magic, magic formula. I just am with her and then me being with her, it helps her calm her. It brings her sleep and peace. And then in the middle of the night, Sophie suddenly appeared, you know, you suddenly, someone's watching you, suddenly realised she was there. Apparently she couldn't sleep. I said, all right, Sophie, just off, you know, back to bed. You can sleep, it, you'll be fine. No, can you come with me? And again, she just wanted me to be there with her. I lay down next to her for three minutes, I think, and off she went. She it didn't, didn't make any difference to what she would have done without me, but the being being there was what she wanted. And it's the same. We may not, it may not make any difference to uh, the choices we make or what we do or where we go, but we know that in the midst of it, God is with us. And his being there with us gives us that certainty. It gives us that peace, gives us that ability to trust that he is with us in the midst of it. As we make decisions, as we face the choices, as we face the pressures of this de these days, as we deal with lockdown again, as we think about how we can look outwards, how we can care for those around us, 
we know that God is with us and he is for us and he loves us and that enables us to trust. So I pray that this would be so, that we would be able to remain faithful, that we would continue to trust even when we don't have clarity. And may we continue to be fruitful, even in the year of a pandemic, knowing that we're following the example of Jesus, that we're keeping our eyes fixed on him who kept his eyes on the Father, seeing what he was doing and doing the same. May we also do the same as we fix our eyes on Jesus, knowing that he is, called, he is calling us to live as he lived, creative ways, creative ways of living a gracious and compassionate way, knowing when to rest and when to work and expecting the unexpected. I pray that this might be so for each one of us this week. Amen. Anna, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us this morning. As we draw our time to a close today, I just want to remind you that we have called the church to pray three times a day, Monday to Friday during the four weeks of lockdown, 8 a.m. midday and 7 p.m. And we'd love you to come and join us. It's been an amazing journey so far as we've pushed in in prayer and we'd love you to come and be part of that. Uh, the Zoom link, uh, we can send that to you if you still don't have it, uh, but do come and join us or set a reminder on your phone and just join us in prayer wherever you are. Let's pray together now. Loving Father, we thank you for speaking into our lives this morning. We thank you for your love for us. And we ask now that you will bless us in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we go from here into whatever life looks like for us, whether that's staying in the house or whether it's heading out to work, Lord, will you use us? May we carry you with us. You've blessed us to go and be a blessing. So may we indeed bless those however we can during this season. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. We are back online tonight at 8pm. Come and join us then. God bless.